and at that point in the recording. So welcome everyone. This is the final dissemination webinar for Work Package 2 under the project of Paradigm. Um, what you see on your screen are the um, Work Package leads who have led uh, the charge on Work Package 2 work. Um, that is me, Stuart Faulkner. Um, my colleague, uh, Ellen Huff Davis um, from Oxford University as well. And we have been um, admirably co-led by my colleagues from Bayer, Matthias and Mallar. The uh, bulk of the data analysis um, must be acknowledged to uh, go to my colleagues from the BU Athena Institute in the Netherlands, that is Karina and Nicole. And um, the, this webinar and a lot of the dissemination material would not have been possible without my colleague uh, Liber at the bottom. Our agenda for today is we'll have a short introduction uh, to Paradigm, um, the um, why we've done gap analysis. Uh, I'll go through some of the methodologies that has um, broader implications as to what we've done and why. I will take one pause after the method. Uh, and then we'll gallop on into the uh, findings and next steps. And I'll take a second pause at the end for some final questions and answers. And considering it's Friday afternoon, I really hope to wrap this up uh, in uh, around about 75 minutes. So, we have an echo. Um, just a reminder, anyone who's uh, not speaking, please could you fully mute yourself? Thank you. So, just a reminder, um, Paradigm is, is a, a public-private partnership uh, under the Innovative Medicines Initiative, uh, with whose broad aim is to drive meaningful and systematic patient engagement in medicines development. It is a uh, 34 member consortium and when we talk about patient engagement it's important to uh, bring to you the, a definition of how we have defined patient engagement and that is an effective and active collaboration of patients, patient advocates, patient representatives and their carers in the processes and decisions within the medicines life cycle along with all other relevant stakeholders um, where appropriate. Um, that is acknowledging that um, um, there is uh, patient engagement uh, and patient um, um, public involvement um, that, involve, that occurs in other parts of um, uh, health and healthcare, um, outside of medicines development and in other contexts. But uh, within this, within Paradigm, we specifically focused on uh, the uh, patient engagement in medicines development. And also acknowledging that we within Paradigm are uh, just one actor in, in a number of other actors and platforms and initiatives in, in the global patient engagement landscape, really trying to all move within um, the same direction. And then for that paradigm, we have uh, two additional partners, two key partners that we have. Um, one of them is the, the UPATI uh, platform for patient uh, engagement uh, training uh, and education, and also um, patient-focused medicines development at PFMD. So our mission within Paradigm was to contribute to a sustainable framework that enables meaningful patient engagement and demonstrates a return on engagement for all those players. And in doing so, uh, developing processes, uh, tools, templates, and frameworks um, will help enable that. And a key point in the mission is that return on engagement, because that is what we have, we have heard repeatedly. Um, I, as a stakeholder, ask the question, if I engage with patients, um, how do I demonstrate value and a return for that uh, engagement? We have been pragmatic in our decision to focus both on medicines development, but also uh, three stages in the life cycle of medicines development and they are the research and priority setting so for example uh, patient input on uh, unmet medical needs that is critical for prioritization early dialogues with regulators and APA bodies so getting those patient perspectives to inform access, access decisions and also in the design of clinical trials and furthermore we've also been mindful to consider um, additional needs for vulnerable populations um, specifically 
uh, the, the elderly, uh, their carers and young people. And the reason why we've chosen uh, these particular elements to look at is that um, we really felt that these, while there's some very good pockets of, of activities and efforts going on here, that actually uh, these uh, were uh, both important, but also um, often fragmented. And in some cases, um, particularly the vulnerable populations are often poorly served by current um, efforts for patient engagement. Uh, paradigm. Stuart, Stuart, how do you define elderly people, elderly patients? Do you have a defined age threshold or something? Uh, like we, this? we do not have. Uh, it broadly comes. Uh, we have uh, uh, an important uh, partner here from from Alzheimer's Europe, um, and so we've we've um, we've sought um, uh, you know inputs and workshops with with members uh, for for patients with with dementia. So we don't have a specific okay. aim, but that has been our, 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 our boundary in that sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Paradigm Fits uh, has seven functional work packages, and, and you just see I've highlighted work package two, and it's a key linkage um, um, really through, um, through the sort of um, underlying research right the way through to the legacy deliverables that I will describe uh, in a moment. And so when we, when we think about what we want to achieve within Paradigm, um, trying to strengthen system readiness, or at least moving the needle um, more in that direction, uh, we really have to make sure that we are both um, feeding forward that information, but also constantly looking back. And so strengthening that system readiness can really only be uh, fully enabled if we develop um, a workable suite of tools uh, and methods and metrics and frameworks uh, that can enable the strengthening of that system readiness. And those tools and and, and, and uh, methods really need to be based upon a much more um, substantial and stronger understanding of actually stakeholder needs, expectations and preferences for meaningful, ethical and sustainable patient engagement. And in doing so, we can then identify where those needs are not being met and at the same time ensuring maximum synergies with uh, similar initiatives along the way. So that is really um, where work package two fits in it's, um, is really that bridge between understanding the needs and expectations and translating those into some tangible outputs that the consortium can work on uh, and others can work on as well. I just want to take a pause there because I'm getting a lot of feedback from someone who's not muted. So could everyone just please have a check to mute themselves? Thank you. I will continue. So that really leads us to where we uh, work package to set its objectives was to identify and collate existing practices and processes relevant to patient engagement in medicines development and then on that perform a gap analysis of those existing practices and processes against the identified needs, expectations and preferences uh, from uh, work coming out of work package one. So you might be asking yourself, well, why do we need a gap analysis? We already know where the gaps are. Well, that to an extent is true, but actually doing a, a gap analysis actually gives us a much stronger uh, and uh, methodological narrative as to really confirming those known gaps or those anecdotal gaps, and which are often underpinned by um, who shouts the loudest, um, but also really surfacing some of those lesser known gaps or unknown gaps that really might normally get missed. And so from that, we can really understand and focus our efforts much more closely in the rest of the work within Paradigm to really address where those needs and expectations um, are not being met. And another good reason for this gap analysis also is it was not aimed to, to point the finger or, or really uh, cast, a, cast a shadow of doom and gloom on the, on the whole patient engagement landscape, um, saying that you know, nothing is being done well and nobody's doing a good job. Um, actually, it really is, is, is quite the inverse of that, actually. And we really wanted to highlight where those, those um, efforts really should be focused on something that is meaningful uh, and impactful and use this as a mechanism to stimulate both ourselves and others to really, really focus those efforts where they're synergist and, and added great value, greatest value um, to, um, uh, to, to enhance patient engagement. So we've talked about our aims about um, doing an analysis on practice and processes. So what do we really mean by practice and processes? So the, 
the needs and expectations and preferences that were identified by the previous work package um, resulted from a, from a three-stage Delphi methodology. So there was a, a large uh, list of about 50 criteria that were all agreed important for effective, meaningful patient engagement. And most of those consisted of uh, process and outcomes criteria. So based on that, we, we defined that we would uh, make sure we included and performed an in-depth analysis on, on uh, material that would be uh, relevant to um, process and outcomes. And so that formed at three levels. We would review overarching framework and guidances that cover the key principles for patient engagement activities. Uh, at the next level, the processes. So that's the application of the theory. So that's the, the methods and the tools and the templates used. Uh, right the way down to case studies, um, really honing in on some of those, those individual experiences or individual setups um, where patient engagement uh, was, was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Another way of thinking about this when we think about practice and processes is broadly is, is the what to do and how to do it, or alternatively, what was done and how was it done. The other thing that became quite notable when we looked at the criteria coming out of Work Package 1 for preferences and expectations is um, it would be quite challenging to translate those into something that we could query um, in, in, a, in a database of existing practices and processes to, to, to produce something quite tangible and actionable. And we, we identified quite early on that this might be um, potentially a case of trying to compare um, uh, apples and oranges. So for that, we, uh, uh, we, we tried to build a mechanism by which uh, we could really accept a lot of information coming from other, other data sources, but also other sources within Paradigm. And, and at that point, I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, Nicole, just to uh, describe why, um, why we needed a framework and briefly describe how we uh, developed a tool to work with that. Nicole? Um, yes, thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, so we built a uh, framework in order to identify um, the gaps. And um, the main aim of the identified gaps in the current patient engagement process is to build tools um, that contribute to more sustainable patient engagement. But to identify uh, gaps, we first needed to understand what uh, sustainable patient engagement is and uh, the corresponding quality criteria. Uh, in the literature, there are several frameworks available which shows uh, good patient engagement practices, practices. But also from literature, we know that uh, good patient engagement depends on the context and what all engaged uh, stakeholders value. So therefore, we, for Paradigm, we followed a knowledge co-production approach to make sure that we involved all uh, stakeholders in the development of this framework or tool. So as a starting point, we used uh, existing uh, frameworks and I think Stuart will highlight in the following slides how we integrated the voices of all involved stakeholders in Paradigm in order to make sure that we have an end project, a framework that includes all criteria which are important uh, for the different stakeholders in the process. Thank you, Nicole. So in, in building essentially sort of a straw man framework, that gave us the ability to develop a tool or a gap tool. And that tool would then be used to interrogate the, the information that we were going to look at on those initiatives. But it was important that that tool would allow us to accept a lot of inputs. And that's, that's just what Nicole has described. So we took um, some uh, patient engagement quality criteria from the, the, the current PFMD guidance and transposed it onto our, our straw man framework. That then allowed us to accept the outputs coming from Work Package 1, which were a very large survey that was uh, undertaken uh, to really, really hone on on a few uh, identified uh, needs and expectations for patient engagement. It also allowed us to accept some of the outputs from some separate workshops we had with individual uh, stakeholders and patient populations that um, we really felt needed extra attention that a survey couldn't, uh, couldn't answer. And that was a, a workshop with um, patients uh, with dementia, a separate workshop with young people, and a third workshop with a number of um, health technology bodies uh, under HTA International. We were then allowed us to transpose those 50 odd criteria coming from the three stage Delphi methodology on top of that framework, and also incorporate some of the other learnings coming from other work packages within Paradigm, 
those that were building a, a monitoring and evaluation framework to really help uh, demonstrate that return on engagement, and also some of the tools that will, were already being developed uh, by Work Package 4. So that resulted in us allowing us to map all the criteria under a series of themes, 14 in total, relating to process and outcomes, which really comes back to the, the, the juxta of this, that that's, that's, those are the elements coming from the criteria that we need to make sure we, we fully realized and didn't lose any important information on the way. And so finally, all of that was transposed into an online gap tool using SurveyMonkey. So that's what you see on the left of your screen. And we translated each criteria into a question and answer structure. So essentially the question related to the criteria that we were asking. And the question was always, was there attention to the criteria in question? And there was an answer structure that the reviewers of each initiative would use to say, well, yes, I can confirm there is evidence that there was attention to this criteria or there wasn't, or it was somewhere in the middle um, or, it wasn't, uh, or it wasn't relative. And so that was then used against a, a data set of uh, initiatives that we'd consolidated from uh, two key existing platforms. One was the PASI platform for uh, case examples. The other one was an existing platform from the Synergist that has a, a global network of, of uh, patient engagement initiatives. And those were enriched multi several times over with other examples coming from consortium members. And so the actual analysis was done by a group of 27 reviewers within Work Package 2, um, both on publicly available information on websites, non-publicly available information coming from the owners of the initiatives. Um, and additionally, we had some very useful qualitative feedback from personal communications with the owners of those initiatives. And that occurred over a, about a four month period um, uh, last year. And so from that, we were able to pull out um, a large, large number of responses and do the analysis on those. So at the end of the methods there, I'm just gonna take a brief pause for some questions and answers. And if anyone has any questions on what we've done or why we've done it before I dive on into the results section. So does anyone have any questions? Um, shaker, shaker. Oh. Is that somebody? Could you please speak up if you're asking a question? No? If not, Maria, if you're on the line, I might ask you just to explain uh, a little bit more um, what we learned from the Delphi outputs, which were the criteria that fed into our uh, our uh, gap analysis here. Is that okay? Yes, yes, I can, I can just say, point out the main findings from the Delphi. Um, it was very interesting in a process because we put on the same panel people from different background, experience and knowledge, and they, they say they, the, the final product was a set of criteria as you explained. There was some uh, conversion uh, among the criteria found in the three different Delphi. Uh, it was very important and interesting for the expert that the practice or good practice has to have uh, or need to have a very good, uh, well designed uh, process with a very aim and objectives very clear and also uh, they point out about the target population it has to be very well defined in order to have a very good uh, outcomes and also as well uh, which was very surprising among the three Delphi was the sustainability that it was it was uh, considered a very good uh, criteria but uh, it was very low score in the in the three Delphi's so that was very surprising and I don't know um, if you want more information as well. Um, another thing important as well was uh, the term uh, in relation to the conflict of interest, it was a very uh, well and thoroughly discussed issue in the three Delphi, especially in the clinical design. That, uh, you know, it seems that it's a still no resolved uh, question about conflict of, of interest. And I don't know if, uh, if you want more detail about any of the criteria. That's, that's wonderful, Maria, thank you. Does anyone have any comments or questions on that before I move on? No, no problem. Then that's perfect you raised the issue about the conflict of interest, Maria, because that um, 
segues me very nicely into my results section. So we continue. So now we, I'm just going to show you um, some results from what we have. So in creating this gap tool, we created a series of 16 uh, questions that uh, describe the basic characteristics of the initiatives that we uh, included in our analysis um, and came up with 44 criteria questions, um, as I said, that were set out in a question and answer architecture. So I'm just showing you just three examples of the characteristics of the initiatives, um, just to give you a flavor. As you can see, we made specific efforts to include initiatives that at least in part covered the design of clinical trials, research, priority setting, and early dialogues with regulators and HTA bodies, because that was one of the fundamental focuses of Paradigm. We also were mindful to include, where possible, examples from, um, that involved uh, parents, guardians, and caregivers, children and young people, uh, and elderly as well. And we were also mindful to include initiatives um, that used a, a variety of methodology. And some of the other characteristics of the initiatives we recorded were uh, therapy area, disease area, geographical coverage, uh, and so forth. So, the gaps. We assessed 44 criteria. We came out with 18 gaps in total. So there were two general gaps, so overarching gaps that weren't related to a specific criteria that we were assessing against, but really emerged as we did the, the larger analysis. And then 16 specific gaps in 11 of the 14 themes that we were assessing against. And so those two general gaps are what you see here. The first one was a general lack of structured reporting of the patient engagement activity. So to, to explain that, that this, um, we really found that the, the fairly the, the basic information, the what was done with who and when using what methods, what were the outcomes, um, what changed as a result of that activity and what were the learnings were. For the, for the broad spent, um, that was um, either very fragmented um, often spread over multiple unstructured data resources or was lacking entirely. There were some good examples, but even some of the, the, the better examples we saw um, often, I think, were, were miss missing some of those key learnings that would permit a broader knowledge gain for those who are looking to learn and improve the patient engagement activities. So that was, that was the first general gap. The second one was a lack of consistent translation of the principles within a framework and guidance through to those implementation and case studies. So what we found in case studies, actually it was, it was difficult to, or, or for the most part, entirely lacking that there was any obvious um, uh, following of, of defined guidances or principles that were, were documented in those, in those case studies, um, or acknowledgement from some of the owners that those weren't necessarily followed. And then on the second level, um, we also found that, again, while there were some very good framework and guidances, and many of those guidances often lacked some, some granularity um, is to, into how those principles and criteria could be or should be implementable in practice. So I'm talking about things like signposting out to um, resources that would be relevant to a certain stakeholder or certain um, disease or therapy error. And a third element, although this wasn't a, a gap per se, is we often found um, that a number of the criteria had two elements to them. They would have a process element and a context element. So to give you an example, one criteria was uh, training in uh, roles and responsibilities for all. So that's a process element. And then the context element would be that that training material was accessible to all participants. And so again, um, overall, we often found that it was that second contextual element was uh, often missing or lacking. So we talk about general accessibility of material, availability of material, and general understandability of material that was often missing. So on to the 16 specific gaps against criteria. So what you see on your screen now uh, will be a series of tables. On the left-hand side is the theme, the overarching theme. And on the right hand side are the criteria that were mapped under that theme. So just remember there, there, were, there were many criteria mapped under individual themes. I'm only showing you where we 
had a gap in a certain criteria. So for the theme selection of participants at adequate representation, we found that there overall was not attention to the criteria addressing a clear description of the criteria followed to identify patient representatives needed. So here it was often uh, difficult to uh, understand, um, ascertain, um, or find uh, you know, information to confirm that criteria had been followed um, or what those criteria were to identify patient representatives. Um, and we had some reports back that um, uh, this was um, categorically not done um, in terms of uh, following uh, criteria. And often where those criteria were followed, um, uh, it was reported a few times that it was limited to um, diversity of, uh, for example, uh, gender and disease and missing some of the broader diversities of socio and economic factors. The next theory, sorry, the next theme for empowerment to stakeholders, uh, we found a gap training in their roles and responsibilities with training material accessible to all participants. So that's the example I've just given where there was a, a, a process and a context element. Again, um, not necessarily um, that training didn't happen, um, but um, uh, there, was, there was ambiguity about uh, where it did happen, um, uh, to what extent, and also um, particularly um, that was uh, missing was, was whether that training material was, was genuinely available and accessible to all participants. And the third theme around transparency of roles, scope and involvement. Uh, we have found another gap about communicating any changes that could occur during the patient engaging initiative up front. And um, similar to the last one, um, uh, although communication may occur, um, we often found that there was no, um, uh, that this, did, this didn't occur or it was very difficult to confirm that this, this occurred um, to any formative uh, uh, method. And we had a few respondents um, confirming that actually um, communication um, often didn't get past those internal boundaries um, of an organization back to the patient or patient organizations. The next theme was around communication and feedback and we found two gaps here. One around legal agreements written in a clear and accessible way. And the second, including a dissemination communication plan sharing process and outcomes. So for the legal agreements written in a clear accessible way, um, we had a number of reports back that there were assumptions uh, these agreements were in place and written in a clear accessible way based on the fact that there were long-standing partnerships between the engaging stakeholder and the engaged but often people could not confirm um, uh, that those legal agreements were available or written uh, in a clear and accessible way and similarly for the communication and dissemination plan um, uh, in some instances um, uh, dissemination communication didn't bridge that internal boundary to the external uh, stakeholder or if it did occur, it didn't follow uh, an agreed plan um, or there was no plan in place. The next theme, sustainability, was an interesting one because we found a gap uh, about the formation and maintenance of a, of a long-term partnership between stakeholders. And although that came up as a gap, when we buried down into the, some of the qualitative responses coming back, there were some very pragmatic answers as to why the partnership um, between stakeholders might not be long-standing. Um, respondents often said that um, the, the patient engagement um, initiative was only designed to be one-off, or even if it, they wanted it to be longer, um, there were uh, time and resource constraints um, that prevented that. More encouragingly, um, a number of organizations reported that they were actively in the processes of trying to maintain and build uh, longer-term partnerships between uh, various stakeholders. The next theme is around uh, general legal and ethical considerations, and that consisted of five criteria, um, code of conduct, privacy policies, potential discriminatory, coercive, and unethical behaviors, management of conflicts of interest, and general terms and conditions of all policies and confidentiality agreements. So there were five criteria here, and we found um, gaps across the board. So um, that relates back to um, what Maria reported that they found uh, an unresolved topic from the uh, Delphi methodology, and that certainly is reflected here. Not to say that these were none of these considerations occurred or not, but it was 
again, uh, very ambiguous as to whether um, they were all fully uh, considered. Many reported that, again, there were assumptions um, that these were being taken care of by the engaging organization, or um, uh, it was not possible to confirm that each one of these considerations um, had been adhered to. Some other reports were that while there were some general uh, documentation uh, covering these topics, um, specific tools and templates covering each of those five um, criteria um, did not exist. So moving rapidly on to um, the final three themes, supportive resources. Uh, we found a gap in, in clear, transparent and fair financial compensation frameworks to be in place and be available. So the good news is that it was reported back that you know, uh, pretty much across the board, patients were being compensated um, financially for their time. But actually, um, uh, following a, a clear financial compensation framework was often missing, or having access to that compensation framework um, was ambiguous. Uh, and also, um, it was ambiguous as to whether um, patients, again, um, had access to that uh, as well. The last two themes relate to outcomes. So uh, the theme of impact for R&D, we found a gap for the criteria um, proposing metrics to measure impact of patient engagement. Um, that wasn't too surprising to us because that was already something that we had pre-identified and there's an entire work package within Paradigm addressing this, um, but it was nice to clarify that much more concretely. Uh, and actually this um, essentially was the highest percentage of categorical no um, this was not being uh, addressed and, and those initiatives that were at least considering this, um, th those efforts were often quite fragmented and limited. And similarly for the theme of learning and reflection, again, we found three, three gaps there, proposing an evaluation framework, um, tools and monitoring systems to evaluate within that framework, and also a clear link between evaluating the criteria against the aims and objectives of the practice were also um, fundamentally missing or where they did exist, um, they were um, lacking detail and granularity. So that's a lot of gaps. So you might be wondering, well, what do we do with all of that? How do we translate that into something that's tangible and actionable? Um, and that's certainly a question that we had to mull over ourselves as well. So after we had all those gaps, we performed one further process step um, at last year's um, Patient Engagement Open Forum in September, where we, acknowledging that 18 gaps, um, we were over halfway through the project, it would not be practical or feasible um, for Paradigm to address all of those gaps identified in, certainly in a, in a meaningful way within the time we had left. So we presented those gaps to a, an audience at a large workshop at that open forum. And more importantly, there was a, a good representation of people outside of Paradigm who were, who were not familiar um, with our work. And we asked them two questions. We said, can you help us prioritize that list of gaps um, that we're presenting to you um, and prioritize them on the basis of those that you think are practical and feasible and meaningful to develop within, within Paradigm? And why? Why have you chosen that gap to prioritize? And secondly, we also needed a reality check. Uh, patient engagement landscape is very fast moving and evolving. Um, so acknowledging that from the point that we'd done the analysis, um, there were new guidances and new tools that uh, had come available. So we also asked the audience actually provide a reality check, which ones are those gaps that we've identified are actually already being addressed by other initiatives so we can really um, avoid redundancy and really make sure we're allocating our efficiencies um, properly. And for the most part, actually, that went extraordinarily well. And during that, we re were really, doubt really able to focus on just a few of those gaps and a few of those gaps that were, were meaningful and could provide a, dan a tangible outcome. And so this is what you see here. So the table you see in front of you, the uh, on the left-hand side in green, there are five uh, legacy tools that um, Work Package 4 
had already started to create because they were already identified as being important and, and needed um, you know, extra work to do so. So that's a code of conduct, conflicts of interest and how to manage those, um, creating and sustaining community advisory boards, updating um, the UPATI industry guidance documents and some additional HTA resources. So the gaps that we found in our work here and those prioritized coming from the workshop have fed in to those existing tools that are being developed and help shape those. Similarly, the orange that you see at the bottom, there were further tools around capacities and capabilities. So some of the process related gaps were fed into that. And then the outcomes related gaps have also fed into another work package, work package three, who are developing a monitoring and evaluation framework and a suite of metrics to demonstrate that return on engagement. And then on the right hand side of that table in blue, so these are some new tools that are directly coming out from that prioritization exercise that we're now building as an extra set of legacy tools to complement those ones we've already started on. So the tool to support the identification of patient representatives. So you may remember that was the very first gap uh -huh. we talked about. We have the guidance to facilitate reporting and dissemination of patient engagement activities. So that was one of the overarching gaps. And the final one is, is where we identified actually that we could within paradigm we could synergize with some already really important work that had already gone on around legal agreements that have been led by uh, we can and pfmd and, and the national health council um, those documents have been created but actually there was a second um, synergistic set of guidances that we could um, help with around providing some lay uh, lay language um, uh, explanation of those quite detailed legal agreements so those are the some of the suite of legacy tools that we we're taking forward and developing within within paradigm so i think the final question comes from all of this as well what have we learned from all of this um you have some of my recommendation my recommendations on screen there but really i think some of the take-home messages are that coming back to what i said at the beginning this was not designed to point the finger and and paint a very uh, doom and gloom picture of patient engagement um, we really wanted to make sure we were um, really highlighting um, where there could be more consolidated efforts to that and just remember we, we found found gaps in about 40 percent of the criteria we assessed so that means actually for the most part actually everyone's doing quite a good job and so actually with the gaps that we found it has allowed us within paradigm to focus on a very few specific um, areas to focus our efforts on but also I believe that both the criteria that have been uh, identified from work package one through that Delphi methodology and the analysis that we've done here I think really provides a, a good enabling mechanism for for others outside of paradigm to pick up some of these gaps um, and really run with them and, and help develop um, uh, some tools some methodologies some guidances um, to address to address those gaps in a much more uh, synergistic ways we all attempt to try and continue to move that needle um, in the direction of, of, of system readiness so when we come back to uh, the picture I started at the very beginning uh, of the presentation I hope you can realize that I think one of the strengths in paradigm really has been building that that golden thread running through all of the work we've done that constant feed forward and looking back really to ensure that um, what we're doing here um, well, well, well is, is, is valuable and impactful and, and will stand the test of time. So that only leaves me to um, acknowledge um, all the people who've done the hard work here. So a big thank you to all of uh, the partners in, in Paradigm and outside who Paradigm who have made this work, and in particular everyone within Work Package 2 um, who has uh, contributed to the substantial amount of work here and had to listen to me for um, 22 months. So thank you to everyone there. Um, at which point I will pause at the end of the presentation and open the floor up um, to anyone else who has any further uh, questions regarding the presentation and where we go next. Have I all stunned you into silence or does anyone have a, have a question? Well, while you're thinking about it, I might refer to Mala. Um, from an industry perspective, Mala, I mean, what, 
what what can industry do with with, with these these gaps and, and the outputs that we've created here um i think it's it's very timely for industry because uh, while a lot of the pharmaceutical companies out there, they do um, work on patient engagement, as we saw when we pulled up uh, the case studies, because most of those came from industry. So everyone is doing uh, basically a good job. Um, for some of the industry that are maybe starting out or not as advanced as others, I think um, the gap analysis and the gap tool would give us a very uh, good starting point or you know, midpoint even to assess what we're doing. Um, and, and also having work package four and work package three, uh, developing some of these tools and metrics um, can only benefit us um, in the long term to, to make sure that whatever patient engagement activity we're doing um, has some I don't want to use the word standardized form, but at least, you know, it's, um, it's maximized uh, as much as we can when we, when we carry out the activities. Uh, this is Amy Yomer. Um, I represent the International Children's Advisory Network. And I think one of the things that we're hoping comes out of this is that there is a list of resources that are available, including ICANN and the YPEGs, and organizations that can help uh, flesh out details for early on research before it even begins. Um, you know, we feel strongly that that can help support any initiatives that are occurring and we can uh, provide that insight uh, to better avoid some of these later on issues that occur within research. Um, and I just wanted to ask if there's an intent, I didn't see it really um, identified in some of the package materials that have already been distributed, uh, but I wanted to see if there was an intent to later include this as resource information. Thank you. Yes, that's that's a very good uh, a very good question indeed. Um, Karina, since you're you're leading the work package four efforts, would you would you like to answer on that one? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Speak up, please. Okay. Um, I, I had problems to listen to the question. Can you? Repeat it, please. Uh, what, I, I represent the International Children's Advisory Network, and um, we have seen some of the early on initiatives that have come out with materials. I um, just want to make sure that um, there is a later view to make uh, plans to add ICANN or the YPEGs as resources to projects for researchers and, and companies to ensure that the work before it even begins is uh, thought through to avoid some of the later pitfalls that might occur uh, when kids and families aren't uh, consulted. We're an available resource and there really wasn't any mention of this being a possibility for groups to utilize. Um, and so I'm just seeing like what the future intent is or what the plans are to add that. Yes, uh, in, in, when all the material we are developing, the idea is to add, to add all the resources available and connected to this material. So everything that is already available will be there as well. Yeah, thank you. So, so to, to, to explain that slightly differently, the, a lot of the, the legacy tools that are being developed, we, we're, we're building in um, signposting um, out to to current websites and platforms and other material that, that is relevant to each of those tools so you would have seen that table it's quite a quite a large list of tools and so we're really hoping to to improve that sort of signposting out so when when a user uses a particular tool and and needs to know the question that you've you raised is that well well how do i implement this for for my population or for my needs that we we can try and help bridge some of those gaps um, in that Okay, so the answer then is you will be including ICANN and YPEGs in as available resources. I, I would certainly, I would certainly expect that um, uh, to be so. Thank you. That's yeah. really what we wanted to make sure because, it, you know, without that knowledge, I think it's very difficult to, um, you know, run some of these projects. We really do want to utilize the patient voice, especially the youngest. 
And I should also add, if it wasn't clear from the opening part of our uh, presentation that um, I don't know if we have Begonia on the line, but we also have the uh, uh, the Kids Hospital in Barcelona as one of our as one of our partners, and they've um, uh, Begonia has really been uh, leading leading the way there in in uh, running the workshops that we had uh, with young people, and also ensuring that we're we're doing what we can uh, to sort of uh, take account of some of those considerations when we develop the tools that we're developing. That's great. Thank you. To continue on that, Begonia is, uh, and Nikan is contributing to all the materials we're developing, so they are having a look, a close look to, to everything and contributing from their perspective. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the floor? No, that's fine, it's understandable. It's late on a Friday afternoon. You all want to go home. So at that, uh, that is, I think, a good point to, for me to stop the recording.